in which I now call the Prime Minister to answer questions from Sir Edward Lee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, forgive me, Mr. Speaker. I visited yesterday Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital to see the first clinically approved vaccine being given to people in London as it is now across this country. This is a fantastic moment uh, for uh, all of us in this House, and I know that everybody will want to join me in thanking the NHS, the Vaccine Task Force, the scientists, all the volunteers who have made this possible. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr um, when I was a spare carrier in the uh, Brexit referendum, that campaign led by my right hon. Friend, we assured the British people that a trade deal was entirely achievable. So can I urge my right hon. Friend to make one last effort, and surely that deal is achievable because we have no intention of lowering our standards. But the EU should know this, that if consistent with national security, he cannot secure that deal for us, this parliamentary party will back him to the hilt because strength comes with unity. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I thank my right hon. Friend, and he's, in, he's entirely right that uh, a good deal is still there to be done, and I look forward to discussing it with uh, Commissioner von der Leyen tonight. But I, I must tell the House that our friends are currently, our friends in the EU, are currently insisting that uh, if they pass a new law in the future uh, with which we in this country do not comply or don't follow suit, then they want the automatic right, uh, Mr Speaker, to, to punish us and uh, to retaliate. And secondly, they are saying that the UK should be the only country in the world not to have sovereign control over its fishing waters. And I don't believe, Mr Speaker, that those are terms that any Prime Minister of this country uh, should accept. Uh, but I, I must tell the House and uh, reassure uh, my right hon. Friend that whether uh, the terms on uh, which we D deliver our new trading arrangements, whether the new arrangements resemble those of uh, Australia's with the EU or whether they're like those of Canada with the EU, I have absolutely no doubt that from January the 1st this country is going to prosper mightily, Mr yeah. Speaker. Let us go over to the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and can I join with the Prime Minister in his comments about the vaccine rollout. It was fantastic to see the first part person, Margaret Keenan, uh, receive the vaccine yesterday. It's a huge national effort, and I want to thank everybody who's been involved with it. Mr Speaker, can I also thank you and the House authorities for enabling me to participate uh, today, notwithstanding the fact that I'm self-isolating. Mr Speaker, a year ago, the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and promised the country these were his words, a permanent break from talking about Brexit. Can the Prime Minister tell us, how's that going? Okay, I, I, I'm delighted to welcome the, the Right Honourable Gentleman from his vantage point of exile in, uh, in Islington and uh, wish him all, the, all, all his spiritual home and wish him all the best uh, uh, in his, uh, his, his self-isolation. Uh, but uh, I can tell him that uh, his own silence on this matter has been sphinx-like. I think, the, uh, and, 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 I, and I, I wonder quite what it is, Mr. Speaker, that has, that has, has kept him from asking this question uh, for so long. Uh, we delivered Brexit, Mr. Speaker, on January the 31st, in case he failed uh, to notice. Going back to Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's Camden, not Islington. Camden. Um, and the Prime Minister starts straight away by deflecting. Same old, same old, whether it's Covid or Brexit. Twelve months ago, he told the British people that he had an oven-ready deal. He didn't say he had half a deal. He didn't say the next stage will be very, very difficult. In fact, he told the British people, this was before the election, he faced them and he told them, these were his words, that the chances of no deal were absolutely zero. And the now Chancellor obviously took him at his word because the Chancellor said in the run-up to the election, 
we won't need to plan for no deal because we have a deal. So a year on, why should anyone who trusted the Prime Minister when he said he had a deal, including his Chancellor apparently, believe a word that he says now? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I hesitate to accuse the Right Honourable Gentleman of deliberately trying to mislead people, but uh, let's, let's be in no doubt uh, that we had a, uh, an oven-ready deal, which was the withdrawal agreement, by which by which, which, which the people voted for, uh, as he rightly points out, by which this country left the customs union, uh, left the single market, and delivered on our promises. And I can tell him that whatever happens, and you know, you must know this, Mr. Speaker, uh, that whatever happens from January the, the, the 1st, uh, this country will be able uh, to get on with our points based immigration system, which we have put into law in fulfilment of our manifesto commitment. We'll be able to get on with instituting free ports, a low tax free ports in places where jobs and growth are most needed around the country. We'll be able to honour our promise to the British people and institute higher animal welfare standards, and we'll be able to do free trade deals, and we'll get our money back as well, Mr Speaker. I don't know what else he wants to see from January the 1st, but all those things will be delivered. Yeah. Returning to Camden with Keir Starmer. Keir uh, oh, I, I see, uh, Mr Speaker, um, apparently get Brexit done just meant the first part of it, the easy bit. I don't remember that being written on the bulldozer at the time. Mr Speaker, last September, the Prime Minister actually hit the nail on the head when he said that leaving without a deal would be, in his words, a failure of statecraft. It would. It would be a total failure. And it will be the British people who pay the price. Does the Prime Minister agree with his own spending watchdog, the OBR, that the cost of that failure, of leaving the EU with no deal, would be higher unemployment, higher inflation and a smaller economy? Mr Speaker, the, the more he talks about Brexit, the more I can see why he tried to avoid the subject for the last, uh, for the, for the last year. We did leave with a, with a very good deal. And under any circumstances, this country uh, will prosper mightily. And uh, I, I, may, I may say to the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman, when he talks about the, uh, the possible adverse consequences for this country of a, a deal on Australian terms, which I think is what he's, uh, what he's talking about, uh, we have yet to hear from the Labour Party what their view is of that matter. Would they, would they vote for it? Yes or no? I mean, he, was, he, he remained totally Delphic last week, Mr Speaker, about his policy on fighting coronavirus. He's, remained, he's totally Delphic about what to do on Brexit as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister talks about indecision. He is absolutely stuck. This is the truth of it. He's absolutely stuck and dithering between the deal he knows that we need and the compromise he knows his backbenchers won't let him do. Mr Speaker, I genuinely hope this is the usual Prime Minister's bluster and that, like one of his newspaper columns, a deal arrives at the last minute. But for some people and their jobs, it's already too late. Yesterday, INEOS, a major employer in this country, announced that they will not now build a new Grenadier car in Bridgend and will move production to France instead. This is a project that just two months ago, the Prime Minister said was a vote of confidence. So hundreds of skilled jobs now won't go to Bridge End. Can the Prime Minister tell us how many more British jobs have to go overseas before he gets on with delivering the Brexit deal that he promised? Minister. Mr Speaker, I think it's a, a bit much of the leader of the opposition to criticise the government uh, for failure to come up with a policy on Brexit when he can't even, and, and, and a bit much for him to attack the putative consequences of coming out on Australian terms, when he can't even say whether he would vote for that uh, deal, yes or no. If he can't say whether he would vote for, vote for our deal, yes or no, then he can't, then I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, he simply cannot he simply cannot attack 
the government's policy until he until he is able to come up with a position of his own, Mr. Speaker. Wrap a towel round his head, decide what he actually thinks. I find it very difficult to take his criticisms seriously. But what I can say is that this country will be ready for whether we have a Canadian or an Australian solution, and there will be jobs created in this country throughout the whole of the UK, not just uh, in spite of Brexit, but because of Brexit. Because this country is going to become a magnet for overseas investment. Indeed, it already is and will remain so. Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister asked me how I'll vote on a deal that he hasn't even secured. Secure the deal, Prime Minister. You promised it. And I can say this, Mr Speaker, if there is a deal, and I hope there's a deal, then my party will vote in the national interest, not on party political lines, as he is doing. Mr Speaker, this is about leadership. The Prime Minister has done 15 new turns. He's had five different plans on, Brexit, or on COVID. And last week, 53 of his own MPs voted against him. So if I were him, I wouldn't talk about leadership. The Prime Minister hasn't always wanted to listen to business. We know what his message to business is. But he should listen to them. Let me quote the CBI. They say the message for business is this, get a deal quickly. Then there's the National Farmers Union. Time is running out, they say. It's very hard to get the final preparations. These are the people the Prime Minister should be listening to, not his backbenchers. And on the question of preparation, the government knew months ago that it needed 50,000 customs agents trained and ready to go from the 1st of January, deal or no deal. So can the Prime Minister tell the House how many of the 50,000 agents will be in place on the 1st of January? That's 23 days' time. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, it's wonderful to get the end of that question. Uh, I can tell it. <laughs> I can tell him uh, that we've invested a billion pounds already in getting this country ready for uh, whatever the uh, trading relationship is that we have on, on January the 1st and uh, 84 million into uh, supporting uh, customs agents a across the, the UK, 200 million uh, into supporting our ports and uh, they're doing an amazing and I want to thank business for the incredible job they're doing of getting ready. Uh, we've all got to get ready because under any view there is going to be change from January the 1st. There will be a change in the way we uh, do business. There will be more opportunities for this country around the world. And I'm delighted by what I take as the increasing signalling I'm getting uh, from Camden. I apologise, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the message from Camden seems to be uh, that actually, uh, given the choice, the right honourable gentleman would vote for a deal rather than not. Did you get that impression? I, I think I did. Hopefully, we can have the final question a little shorter. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I take it that the answer is the Prime Minister has no idea whether the 50,000 customs agents will be in place on the 1st of January. He either doesn't know or he doesn't care. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister said he had a deal. He didn't. He said he would protect jobs. He didn't. He said he'd prepare for any outcome. He hasn't. And whatever may happen in the next few days, there's no doubting that his incompetence has held Britain back. So will he end this charade, end the uncertainty, get the deal that he promised, and allow the country to move on? Minister. Uh, Mrs. Mr Speaker, I, I want to uh, thank the, the right honourable gentleman for, for his final baffling question. La last week, uh, he, last week he, he, uh, as I say, sphinx-like avoided any pronouncement on uh, how this country was going to fight COVID. He refused to uh, support the measures that we have put in place. This, this, this week, he remains deafeningly silent on what he really thinks about a Brexit deal. Uh, while, he, while, he, while, he, while he puts a cold towel around his head, Mr Speaker, lost in thought, tries to work out what his position is, we are getting on to order. Mr Bryant. Mr Bryant. I suggest the whip goes and has a word with him. We're not having that disgraceful behaviour. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, th I think you should, you should give, summon him back. He seems to, he seems to have vanished. Uh, but but wh while, the, while the Right Honourable 
uh, gentleman tries to work out what his position is, we're getting on with the, with the work of, of government. And it's, uh, as, he, as he says, it's a year since his people's government was elected, and I'm very proud that we're delivering on the people's priorities. 6,000 of the 20,000 police officers, Mr Speaker, 14,800 of the 50,000 nurses already, and we're getting on, we're getting on with building every one of the 40 hospitals, in fact 48 hospitals, that we're going to deliver, along with the biggest programme of infrastructure investment in this country for a century, uniting and levelling up across the whole of the UK. And whether the outcome is Canada or whether it's Australia, Mr Speaker, we will be taking back control. And we have already taken back control of our money, our borders and our laws, and we will seize all the opportunities that Brexit brings. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is Coronation Street's uh, 60th anniversary. It's the world's longest-running TV drama serial. This is an amazing landmark, so congratulations to it. But sometimes it feels we've been discussing infrastructure in the North almost as long. However, we've had the OKV report recommending the government committed to HS2 and its full Y-shaped network serving both sides of the Pennines. We've had the positive decision to proceed with it. So as the plans for the eastern leg of HS2 Phase 2B are delivered, are developed, will my right honourable friend consider starting construction from the north? That will be good for jobs in the north, connectivity with the East Midlands, and all of which, of course, drive my right honourable friend's levelling up agenda. Uh, my, my honourable friend is a, 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 huge, a big expert in this field and a great campaigner uh, for, for transport, and he's right about the massive impact that these programmes can have on jobs. And uh, he said, uh, "I'm sorry." Mr. Bryant, I think we need this conversation later. Fine. Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I was saying, Mr. Speaker, that my, my honourable friend is completely right about the power of, of great infrastructure projects to uh, deliver jobs, and that's why we're getting on uh, with both with the eastern leg of, of HS2 and with Northern Powerhouse Rail. And what I've asked uh, the uh, National Infrastructure Commission and, uh, and, uh, and Network Rail to look at is how those two projects can best be integrated to boost the economy uh, of the whole of the, of the north of the country. Let's head up to Scotland to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, by this government's own admission, it was confirmed that Northern Ireland is getting the best of both worlds, access to the EU single market and customs union. This is great news for businesses in Northern Ireland, but at least Scotland, who also voted to remain, dealing with the hardest of Brexits. What is good for Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, is surely good enough for Scotland. Why is Scotland being shafted by this double dealing? Can the Prime Minister explain to Scottish businesses why this is fair? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, in common with the whole of the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, Scotland will benefit from the subst uh, and, uh, in sub substantial uh, access of devolved powers for, for Scotland uh, and will benefit from, from the, uh, the regaining of money, borders and laws. And as I never tire of telling uh, my friend, the gentleman opposite, in spite of all his, uh, his jeering, Mr Speaker, Scotland will take back control of colossal quantities of fish which I think is something that the people of, of, of Scotland uh, deserve to be able uh, to exploit uh, for the advantage of those communities. Ian Blackford, second question. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister can spin all he likes, but everyone can now see the total content this UK government holds for Scottish interest. Northern Ireland gets the single market and customs union. We get nothing. Members of his Scottish branch office told them how unfair and damaging it would be to deny Scotland's access to the EU single market and customs union, whilst at the same time delivering it for Northern Ireland. Ruth Davidson even said that such an act would undermine the integrity of the United Kingdom. The former Scottish Tory constitution spokesperson said it would be the end of the union. They, along with the former Scottish secretary, said that if this were to happen, they would all resign. So, Mr Speaker, since the Prime Minister is ready to sell out Scotland's interests, with his Brexit deal. Does he expect to receive these resignation letters from Baroness Davidson or her cohorts before or after he travels to Brussels tonight? 
Uh, well, I think Mr. Speaker, the only, only reasonable answer to that question is I think it's highly unlikely that those letters will uh, arrive. And I think he, he does gross injustice to, uh, to Scotland, uh, to the future of Scotland, uh, which, will, which will be assured within the single market of the United Kingdom. And I believe, in spite of the slight negativity I detect from him, uh, I believe uh, will, uh, Scotland, as long with the rest of the UK, will benefit from a very strong trading relationship with our friends and partners across the Channel, whatever the circumstances, whatever the terms we reach tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. I am supporting Turn on the Subtitles, a campaign being led by my Bishop Stortford constituent, Henry Warren. There is a wealth of evidence that default same language subtitling can have a dramatic effect on children's literacy, particularly for disadvantaged children, which I know is a great priority for my right honourable friend, given the potential impact of COVID on the attainment gap. Will the Prime Minister support a government consultation to turn on the subtitles to really explore this potentially transformative opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I am sure I speak for many uh, honourable members when I say I am a massive supporter of subtitles myself, particularly with some of these, uh, these crime dramas from America. Uh, and, uh, I, I, uh, I know that, and I think her campaign is, is, is excellent, and uh, I can tell her that all the departments uh, that have a stake in this uh, will be working with her uh, to, to see what we can do to take the matter further. Let's head down to Brighton Pavilion with Caroline Lucas. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last week, we learned that UK Export Finance has been approached to back the East African crude oil pipeline. This is a climate catastrophe that will produce emissions equivalent to all of the UK's annual flights. Not only that, but a recent PQ response to me confirmed that UKEF has six more fossil fuel projects under consideration. So ahead of the Climate Ambition Summit this weekend, how can the Prime Minister claim any climate credibility whilst ploughing public money into dirty fossil fuel projects overseas? Are these the actions of a rogue, out-of-control government department? Or worse, does the Prime Minister actually approve of them? Uh, Mr Speaker, the, the uh, right honourable lady, I hope, knows that uh, we're moving away dramatically and at speed from uh, a UK export finance to uh, support fo fossil fuel exploration around the world. Uh, but, of course, it's a, it, hydrocarbons remain a significant uh, industry in Scotland and uh, many other places. And insofar as there are legitimate contracts uh, that uh, are at risk of being frustrated, then we can't do that. But uh, I really think her criticism of the government is absurd. When you look at the overall record, the ambition of this government, the first country in the developed world to set a target of net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, I know actually when she's uh, being less polemical, uh, she's uh, had some, some kind words uh, to say about the, the government's programme, and I, I certainly support her in that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would my rational friend confirm that our future immigration policy will welcome law abiding citizens of other countries to our country? Those who come to this country and are sub subsequently convicted of serious crimes, including rape and murder, should expect to be removed from this country to keep our citizens safe. Prime yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, indeed, I was astounded to see that 42 members on the opposite benches wrote to the Home Secretary opposing, uh, opposing, opposing the deportation of foreign national criminals, whilst uh, the leader of the party opposite uh, maintained his uh, characteristic Delphic silence on the matter. Mr. Speaker. Lyndon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, why does the Prime Minister think we have now seen 15 consecutive polls showing majority support for Scottish independence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the people of Scotland, as the Honourable Gentleman knows uh, very well, voted in uh, 2014 by a substantial majority to remain in the uh, UK. I believe that was the right decision and I believe that were they ever uh, to be asked in the future, uh, the same question again, I believe it would be the same answer. But as he, as he, as he has said, uh, and as, as, the, as the gentleman opposite have said many times, it was a once-in-a-generation event, uh, Mr Speaker. They said to Stafford with Field Clark. Field Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Staffordshire is currently in Tier 3, so unfortunately, due to restrictions, many local businesses are either unable to open or having to operate differently 
which is having significant impacts on my constituents' lives and livelihoods. So will the Prime Minister commit to providing sufficient testing in Staffordshire to help us to get out of Tier 3 as soon as possible? And will my right honourable friend assure me he will do all he can to support businesses and protect jobs in Stafford, as well as creating new employment opportunities for young people after December 31st? Prime Minister. I, I, I thank my honourable friend. And, and number one, yes, of course, we will do everything we can uh, with NHS Test and Trace plus our, our armed forces to roll out uh, community testing uh, in Stafford. And number two, of course, we uh, want to support uh, Stafford and the people of Stafford uh, with a, uh, a massive programme of, of business support, uh, including uh, nearly 1.4 million uh, bounce back loans uh, and grants, rate relief and VAT deferrals. Question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister will fully appreciate that the use of gross domestic product uh, as a measure is abstract uh, in terms of dealing and understanding prosperity, uh, but people talk about 15% drop in GDP as a result of the pandemic. If you look at a simple analysis of car sales as an indicator of economic performance, uh, relative to uh, Germany, we've lost 184,000 car sales in the UK, or versus France, 100,000. Behind those numbers, which are big hits of PLC, UK PLC, are jobs and businesses. How does the Prime Minister explain this relative economic performance? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, government of this country has done everything we can to support business uh, and support uh, our lives and livelihoods throughout this pandemic. Uh, and it remains the, the case as, as he, uh, with more than 200, uh, I think now £260 billion pounds of, of support. And it remains the case, as, as, as he, he mentions uh, France and, 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 uh, and Germany, he should know, uh, Mr Speaker, that unemployment, in spite of all the difficulties this country has faced, unemployment remains lower in this country than France, uh, than Italy, uh, than Spain, uh, than uh, and, and the United States. So, uh, yes, it's tough, but we're going to get through it, and we're going to get through it together. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I commend my right honourable friend's bold ten-point plan for a clean, green industrial revolution and ask for his support to help me deliver a 26-hectare renewable energy manufacturing hub at Oldside in the port of Workington, continuing to deliver on our promises 12 months ago when I turned Workington blue? Excellent. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I thank my honourable friend and I congratulate him on his achievement and on his anniversary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, what we're, we're, we're looking very seriously. The Department of Base is looking at uh, the uh, programme, the, the project that he uh, that he mentions, and uh, I know that the department is going to be assessing that application very carefully, and uh, will keep him informed. Let's head up to Scotland with Pete Wishart. Pete Wishart. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister didn't quite answer my honourable friend from Glasgow East on why support for independence is so high, so maybe I can maybe tempt him with a couple of reasons. Firstly, the, the leadership of the First Minister, which the Scots contrast with him. Then there's his crazy, chaotic Brexit, a Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for. But it's also down to him personally. He is probably the biggest single recruiting sergeant that we have and for that, we mightily thank him. So can I ask him, on behalf of all of us who want to see an independent Scotland, could you please take a bow and accept our many thanks? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted to, to accept the, the thanks of, of the uh, Honourable Gentleman. But I may say that, uh, that I think it's really thanks to, to him and to the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, that uh, we've been able to keep our wonderful United Kingdom together because it's the sheer incoherence yeah. of their position, their refusal to address the tough uh, questions of what breaking up the UK really means, the impacts uh, on, uh, on our budgets, on our economy, uh, the impacts on Scotland, uh, the impacts on our whole country. It, it's, it's their manifest inability to explain uh, what they actually mean, Mr Speaker, that meant the people of this country voted, in, uh, Scotland voted in 2014 to remain part of the UK. They're right then and they'll be right in the future to stay. Let's head up to Harrow with Bob Blackman. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is now three and a half years since the Grenfell fire tragedy that cost the lives of 72 people. Yet there are still 3.6 million leaseholders living in potentially dangerous, unsaleable and unmortgageable properties. The government quite rightly set aside a billion pounds towards the remediation of ACM, non-ACM cladding. But this expires on the 31st of December this year. 
and it's clear that it's going to be insufficient to cover the costs. So could my right hon. friend set out for the House what the plan is uh, for next year to remediate the cladding, and will he give a cast iron guarantee that leaseholders will not have to pay a penny piece towards the cost of replacing this unsafe cladding? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right to draw attention to uh, this injustice and what's happening with leaseholders uh, at the moment. Uh, that's why we put £1.6 billion into uh, removing unsafe cladding. Uh, I don't want to see leaseholders uh, being forced to pay for uh, this remediation. And I can assure my honourable friend we're looking now urgently before the expiry of the current arrangements uh, at what we can do to take them forward and uh, support leaseholders who I think are in a very unfair position. Very well, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Is the Prime Minister aware that his government risks failing a generation of children in my constituency of Enfield North and across the country, as we've seen, as the analysis shows uh, this week, that only one in six pupils on free school meals uh, who are most likely to fall behind their peers will benefit from the programmes to help them catch up on lost learning as a result of COVID. Does the Prime Minister agree that this is simply not good enough? And can he explain why we are in this dire situation nine months on? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I share her anxiety about the impact of differential learning uh, on kids in our schools across the country, because there's no doubt that uh, different, different groups have been affected in different ways by the, by the pandemic. That's why we put a billion pounds uh, or more now into the, into the catch-up funds. But, but it's also why it's so important uh, to make sure that kids do uh, go to school and do stay in uh, school. And that's why we put all the emphasis that we have uh, throughout this pandemic on maintaining kids in school even if it's put pressure on the hospitality sector and other parts of our economy. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I wonder if my right honourable friend, if he were to find a small gap in his very, very busy diary, if he would join me on a visit to the Black Country Living Museum, where I would introduce him to a plate of Black Country battered chips, in, to a pint of Holden's Golden Glow and... <laughs> On all of this, after he has actually reviewed the arrangements the, Black, the museum has made to become a COVID vaccination centre. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, the Black Country Living Museum has become a, uh, or is, is in line to be a, uh, a COVID uh, vaccination uh, centre. And I look forward to my. I've had many happy meetings with him in the in the in the Black Country. And as a proud former resident of Bilston, uh, Mr. Speaker, I look forward uh, to returning uh, before too long. Director. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know you are a strong supporter of the Falklands Islands. The Falkland Islands face the prospect of the fisheries exports to the European Union being subject to tariffs of between 6 and 18 per cent from the 1st of January. Fisheries exports to the European Union account for over 40 per cent of the island's gross domestic product and up to 60 per cent of the government's revenue. This poses a serious challenge to the Falkland Islands. Will the Prime Minister raise this matter when he meets with the President of the European Commission later? Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, and I've, uh, uh, I mean, he's, he's right to raise the issue of the, uh, the, the Falkland Islands and, and indeed other uh, Crown territories and overseas dependencies around the world uh, whose uh, future, whose future trading arrangements must be secured. And that is indeed something uh, that we have raised and will continue uh, to raise on their behalf and make sure that they get the satisfactory assurances that they need. Let's head up to Hertfordshire with Sir Oliver Heald. Sir Oliver. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is aware of the continuing concern in rural communities such as those in North East Hertfordshire about intentional unauthorised development where suddenly caravans appear on land without planning permission. Uh, many of my constituents and I support Proposal 24 in the Planning White Paper, which proposes new powers for councils to tackle this. Will the Prime Minister put his authority behind this so these changes can be made as soon as possible? Yeah. I, I do indeed, Mr Speaker, and I, I think that everybody in the House recognises the distress that uh, unauthorised uh, camps, uh, can, uh, encampments can cause to uh, local communities. Uh, my right on friend is right to draw attention uh, to this. He's right also to call attention to the new powers uh, we're giving both to police and to councils uh, to tackle the matter, and I'm glad of his support. Chief McKay. 
Could the uh, Prime Minister kindly explain to the people of Tier 3 Birmingham, population over 1 million and where almost 2,000 have lost their lives, why he doesn't consider them a priority for receipt of the vaccine? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I really must uh, uh, respectfully disagree with um, the, the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, we, we, the, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and, and Immunisation uh, has set out very clear criteria of, of, of the groups, that, starting uh, with those over 80, the care homes, uh, workers, NHS workers, those in care homes. Uh, he knows the criteria very well. And Birmingham, of course, uh, will, be, uh, will, be, will be amongst them. Of course that's right. I, and I, I, I'm afraid I simply uh, cannot accept the, the premise of his question. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Conservative colleagues across Derbyshire have been working very hard on our bid for community testing to help us tackle COVID. Will my right honourable friend ensure the bid from Derbyshire County Council rece receives the resources and attention that we need to help us in our fight to get out of Tier 3? Prime Minister. Yes, Mr Speaker. And I, I was discussing Derbyshire's bid just the, this morning uh, for a, a big community testing uh, programme, and uh, we will do everything we can, obviously, to support him. I thank him and, and local leaders for what they're doing to promote community testing. Let's head up to Yorkshire with Richard Bergen. Richard Bergen. Mr Speaker, real terms pay cuts for millions of public sector workers, an insulting 37 pence increase in benefits levels and broken promises on minimum wage increases show the Prime Minister wants to pay for this crisis on the backs of the working class. Wouldn't it be fairer to impose a windfall tax on the wealth of the super rich and on those who've made super profits out of the COVID crisis, including those who've won contracts because of their links to top Tories. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I must, uh, again, uh, strongly disagree with uh, what the, the Honourable Gentleman says, because uh, I'm this, everybody on this side of the House is proud not just of the living wage, but of record increases in the living wage, uh, above inflation, uh, pay rises uh, across the board, and, uh, and, and, for, and, of course, we're proud of what we've done to support uh, nurses uh, and, and, and the NHS, a record investment in the NHS. I don't think anybody looking at the uh, the investments this government has made in the, in the public sector could doubt our commitment, and we will continue uh, to do that, Mr Speaker. But what we want to see is our economy recovering and our strong and dynamic private sector, uh, which he disparages, uh, enabling uh, this country to forge forward as it should. Thank you, Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's been almost 12 months since I and many of my colleagues were elected to this House for the first time. And it was a great privilege to deliver my maiden speech in the second reading of the Environment Bill and be on the Bill Committee for uh, this landmark piece of legislation. Does my right honourable friend uh, agree with me that not only is protecting the environment a moral duty, but it presents an economic opportunity, including the creation of jobs for my constituents in Meriden? Yes, Mr Speaker. It's, it's crucial to understand that the 10-point plan for the Green Industrial uh, Revolution is about jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, this, 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 pr this plan, uh, whether it's retrofitting homes or, 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 build, or making wind turbines, Mr Speaker, will generate 250,000 jobs uh, across this country in just the first few years. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, many constituents, especially those emanating from the Punjab and other parts of India, and I were horrified to see footage of water cannon, tear gas and brute force being used against peacefully protesting farmers. However, it was heartwarming to see those very farmers feeding those forces who had been ordered to beat or suppress them. What indomitable spirit, and it takes a special kind of people to do that. So will the Prime Minister convey to the Indian Prime Minister our heartfelt anxieties, our hopes for a speedy resolution to the current deadlock, and does he agree that everyone has a fundamental right to peaceful protest? Prime Minister. Uh, of course, Mr Speaker, and uh, uh, our, our views that the, the right honourable gentleman knows, uh, as the honourable gentleman knows, uh, well, uh, is of course that uh, we have serious concerns about uh, what is happening uh, in, in, between India and, and Pakistan, but these are preeminently matters uh, for those two governments to settle, and I, and I know that he appreciates that point. James Wilde. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn is at the heart of our local community, but it's in, the, in need of urgent modernisation, with cracks in the concrete roof most recently leading to the closure of the physiotherapy gym. 
So with his enthusiasm for building hospitals, can my right honourable friend offer the people of West Norfolk hope and back our bid and build our future hospital? Yeah. Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I want to thank my uh, honourable friend uh, for his campaign and everything he does for his constituents. I, what, what I can tell him is that the, uh, the bid process for, uh, is, is for the remaining eight hospitals uh, is currently being uh, designed. That's the, the eight of the, uh, on top of the 40. Uh, and the uh, DHSC uh, is working uh, with a variety of trusts, including uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Kings Lynn, NHS Trust, uh, as this work continues. Yeah. Can I just gently say to the Prime Minister, next week will be the final one before Christmas of PMQs. Would he update the House on the leak inquiry? 